I started my career uh, as an art major and I went to the University of Texas and my first job uh, out of school because back in those days we didn't have Macs and we didn't have anything but our hands <laughs> so I had to draw everything so I, my first job was an art director and a, a writer at the Richards Group so I have to say that you know to me as we've moved through today and that's how I got in the ad business that creative is really more of a mindset than a skill and that's what I want to talk to you about a bit today at T3 I'm most proud of one thing, that we have built a culture that is inclusive, it's creative, and it allows people to practice their craft. This is what gets me up every day and is what excites me. It's a wonderful place because we really respect each other, and that's the basis for an inclusive team. And I think we talk a lot today about inclusive and what that means, and it means a lot of things to a lot of people, and it's changing. One of the definitions to me is also personality type. And so we're really big on the Myers-Briggs and we try to give everyone this assessment because I think diversity of mindset, diversity of types, personality types is what also brings together these incredible teams. And if we're all alike and we're all thinking alike, you'll never get to the great work because technology has changed everything for us so much. I don't think there's a person in, under this tent who can say how much technology has changed and it continues to change. And it's right smack dab in the middle of everything that we do. Let me digress a bit and talk about cowgirls. Uh, yeah, yeehaw. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a very small town in East Texas, Liberty, Texas. And as a little girl, as early as four or five years old, I was working cattle with my godfather and his rice fields. And I was there side by side with him on a horse and got really comfortable on a horse as a little girl. Through the years, I have always admired cowgirls. I think they're amazing people. And uh, so one day, I took off for the Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Has anyone been there? Ah, it's, it's a great place, it's truly amazing. And I wanted to start really studying some of these historic cowgirls, and I'm talking back to the late 1800s and up to the 1930s. And I discovered something that I really wasn't quite aware of. Now, I knew Annie Oakley, most of you have heard of Annie Oakley, and she competed against men and everybody in the world. I mean, she was actually the first female <coughs> international superstar. She performed before kings and queens and was all over Europe, highly decorated for her marksmanship or markswomanship. She was absolutely amazing. But there are a lot of other women like, women like Tad Lucas, Fox Hastings, Bonnie McCarroll, people you probably are women you haven't heard of. But they were amazing competitors, and I really got a lot of strength from them. And I decided that, wow, you know, they really have something to teach us. And a lot of people don't even know who they are, but they, they are really amazing women. So here I am. Uh, to prove I'm a cowgirl. <laughs> this is me at about three years old, standing out on my porch in Liberty, Texas, and my dad loved to dress me up in little cowgirl outfits. He, was, he wasn't even from Texas. He's from Missouri. So he thought that I needed to be a cowgirl because I was born in Texas. But like I said, my godfather really made me a cowgirl because he put me on a horse and taught me to ride when I was a really little girl, which leads me to shameless self-promotion, which is I wrote a book. Uh, and I realized that these cowgirls needed to be talked about because they are such amazing examples for all of us of grit, authenticity, t determination, creativity. They were real pioneers. To, so in the, say, uh, you know, the whole setting of this concept of pioneering, I mean, there they were. There they were out there doing things that most women could have never accomplished. I mean, they were bulldogging steers. I'm talking about tough competitors. So I wrote this book, and the book is coming out January 23rd, 2018. And this is the first speech, so you heard it here first, that I have publicly announced this book. Uh, and I will also say, as part of my shameless self-promotion, you can order it right now on Amazon <laughs> as a pre-sale. Go, my publisher, Hachette, loves Loves, loves pre-sales. In fact, uh, they're pushing me every day on that. So, but the book is not just about the cowgirls. It's also about my journey, starting a business from the ground up in 1989. And the reason I started this business is because I had to. Most people don't know this story anymore, so give me a second and I'll tell you. We were in a very deep recession 
in the late 80s. Most of you may not have been, been born yet, <laughs> but it was a tough time in Texas. Uh, the savings and loans failed, and the real estate wasn't worth the ground it was built on. So I decided in the agency that I was working in in those days here in Austin that I would write a business plan. And I brought some insurgents along with me, and we decided we were going to do this great thing. And so I started, I just said, well, I, well I'm not going to start an agency. I'm going to do it right here in the agency I'm in. But I made one little mistake. I didn't bring the president of the company along with me. And so by the time I had announced this, he decided he wasn't going to support my plan. So I got mad. I not, not really got mad. I got really pissed off. I was furious because I had so much emotion and integrity built into this plan. So I quit. I didn't even know what I was going to do. I really didn't. I just got mad and quit. So immediately I thought, well, wow, where am I going to get a job in this economy? So, woo, I better do something. So I had all of $16,000 in an IRA. And I went and got that money out and started a tiny little agency that's now T3. And I was scared to death. I'm going to tell you, it was a rough time. But somehow we mustered together and we made it work. So all of that is in the book. It, it talks about just kind of the lessons learned through the years. And it's, it's, it's written for women, but I, honestly, I just read the audio book uh, this week, which is a tough job if you've ever done that. Uh, and I have a huge respect for actors now and people who have to read scripts all day long and memorize things. But um, I really realized that it's a book for anybody He's on a creative journey. Anybody who is looking to increase their own interpersonal power, it's not a book about autocratic top-down power. It's about the power you earn and get within by practicing and by really getting good at your craft. When I started the business, my husband, um, Lee Gaddis, some of you may know Lee. Uh, he's an old cowboy, actually. But he disguised himself as an ad man for many years. <laughs> but he's a fifth-generation Texas rancher. So he and I were having dinner right after I started uh, my little company. And no one could goad me like Lee Gaddis. But he's, we sat down, and he said, all right, so you've got this little agency you just started. What are you going to do to differentiate yourself? from every, every other agency in this recession. And I said, oh, well, we're going to be the art, we'll get, win awards, we're, we'll do great art stuff and win awards, and then we're going to measure it and be the science part. And he just looked at me and said, bullshit. And then he said, try again. So I did, and I made a little bit more sense, and I said, well, it's going to be the art and science of the agency business, and, and we're going to measure things. And again, he screamed bullshit at me. So at this point, I'd had two or three glasses of wine, and I got really mad. And so I just slammed my hand on the table, and I said, damn it, we're going to do kick-ass work for clients who want to kick ass. He stood up, ran to the bar, got a napkin, wrote that down, and it hangs today in the lobby of TJ. <laughs> Uh, he said, there's your business plan. So when I say kick ass in my book, this is something I've been saying for 30 years or even before that. So it's not like some kitschy little name I put on the front of the book. It's our mantra. And you know what? It's your culture wherever you are. If you're freelancing, if you're in a group, it's your culture. you got to own it. And so this is something that we think about, talk about, and reward every day at T3. You cannot say your mantra enough because you've got to embolden people to act on that. So I'm proud that that's still our, still our mantra today. Sometimes it's not just about making money, winning awards, garnering new clients. Sometimes it's about doing the right thing. So some of you may know about this program we have at T3. It's called T3 and Under. Someone coined that phrase many years ago. And some 25 years later, we've had over 100 babies that have come to T3 after their parents are off, uh, finished with their leave. We've had dads, we've had moms, and it's been the most rewarding, soulful thing I have ever done. I've been, you know, given many awards for this, but the real rewards, I mean, I was even honored by Bill Clinton in the Rose Garden of all things. But, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't, it's not that, you know, that really gets you in here. It's seeing these wonderful little children come into our office every day, and it's what we're about. It really defines our culture in so many ways because it says we are inclusive of your family. 
We care about the fact that it's tough to have a baby and run right back to the office. It's not easy. I had to do it. And uh, I'm a mom of three, and it was uh, the toughest thing I ever did. Even though I wanted to stay in the game, it was really tough. But here's the coolest thing about this photograph. So we've done this all these years. We give little red boots to every baby. It's part of our tradition, uh, being a cowgirl, you know. Uh, so these two kids over here, uh, uh, not the one in the middle. That's not a kid. Uh, that's me. Uh, but the two young people in, in this photograph with me were interns last year at T3. And guess who they are? The first two T3 and under babies. And I loved it. And they surprised me because I don't pick the interns. Uh, we have a very exciting intern program, and I don't get to pick those. That We have another team that does that. And when I walked in to see the interns their first day and saw Davis and Haley, I cried. I couldn't believe it. It was just like life comes full circle, right? So, very cool. So today, we're all over the place. I mean, those are our offices, and we're just about to open a little WeWorks thing, WeWorks, in Chicago. So, um, it's, a, it's a very complex business that we're in now. We are working across multiple technolo technologies. We have sometimes huge teams working across the country. And I'm talking about sometimes as many as 30 to 40 people on a team. When you add in the client groups and sometimes our outside partners, there's 30 or 40 people navigating through some very complicated stuff. You know, we, we, we're dealing with really crazy analytics and artificial intelligence and some of the things that we're working on now. So it takes, it takes a real effort to bring these teams together. So how do we do that? You know, how do you do that and, and, and hit it and flaw, do almost flawless work? Now, we do make some mistakes, but not very often. I mean, it's a pretty well-oiled machine. So I, let me step back and just give you a story. Because as creative people, you know that, yes, we have to work in teams because it's almost impossible, well, it would be impossible for one person individually to pull off the stuff we have to do because we have all these different disciplines involved, people with titles that I didn't even know existed or didn't exist three or four years ago. So how do we do this? At the same time that as a creative person, you have an ego and you have your own personal interests, right? I mean, yeah, we're a team, but, but you also have to look out for yourself and you have your own career and your own personal interests. So let me digress and tell you a story from the Old Testament. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories. It's about Nehemiah. I don't even know if you know who he is or if you've ever read the Old Testament of the Bible, but he was a very insightful leader. This is 400 B.C., so get that. This is an old story. But Nehemiah was a very interesting man because he was tasked at a time way back then to rebuild Jerusalem. They were under siege by tribes and, and warring people coming through, destroying them. But they wouldn't build a wall or anything to protect themselves. Now, don't groan and say, oh, my God, it's another leader obsessed with building a wall. Uh, this, is, this was an interesting, I mean, it was times were tough. So, so Nehemiah had this idea. And he went to every person and family along the edge of the city of Jerusalem. And he said, Will you just build a wall right here behind your home or behind your dwelling? And he convinced everybody to do this, and they built the wall in 52 days that had not been built for years. They'd never been able to do this. So I love the Nehemiah story because, you know, what he did is he accomplished something great, but it was also based on the individual interest of each person, and collectively they became a team, and they got something done that saved them. The other thing that's kind of interesting about teams is uh, the Aristotle pro pro project excuse me, that, that Google did. And I won't go into all of it, but if you want to look it up, it's pretty interesting because they wanted to figure out what makes teams work. And they put the smartest people together, the most skilled people together. They did all these things. But the bottom line is what they found out is that you had to have diversity on these teams. It didn't matter who was the smartest one in the room. It mattered about the trust, how people communicated with each other. Were, was each person heard in a meeting and not just sitting there, which is my cardinal sin of any meeting. If you aren't in there talking and speaking up and part of the team, then you shouldn't be in the room, right? So, so anyway, I'm, I'm really excited to say that I found that, you know what? That's kind of what we were doing at T3. That's what we've been doing in these inclusive teams. 
So trust is the bottom line of all of this. Now, how do you start to trust people on your team? It's because over and over they're there and they've got your back. It's over and over they are there to support you. They don't let you down. Now, this story right here is the ultimate trust that I've seen in a while. And this is because UPS had just done a deal with Taylor Swift. And it was top, top, top secret. All over UPS, top, top, top secret. So one of our clients called the woman who has run this account for almost 12 years at T3. They have a trust and a bond that is unbelievable. And she said, Jill, I want T3 to handle this project. We don't want anyone else to know about it, anyone else to even see that's going on. They didn't even tell me. Now, that's kind of crazy, but uh, I trust them to do what they need to do. They put together a team and hid in the bottom basement of our building, and they pulled this thing off in a couple of weeks, this entire campaign. And so that's the kind of trust that we're all looking for. When clients trust you that much, when the team itself was so trusted to do this without even telling their families or anybody, it was, it was crazy. But the trust was at the bottom of all this. But... Sometimes it doesn't work. The worst mistakes I have ever made as a business owner, as a person, is occasionally hiring somebody that looked good on paper. I mean, they were logically, yeah, this person's great. But my gut was saying, something's not right here, you know? But I would hire them because they were so damn good on paper. Then, here they come. A bad apple somehow falls in the barrel. What do you do? What do you do about it? Well, hopefully you correct it as soon as you can, but sometimes it takes a little while, right? So I have this phrase that could be controversial in these days of issues with guns and all that, but I, I go back to my cowgirl roots, and I say sometimes you have to shoot the assholes, and I am not kidding when I say that. <laughs> they will creep in your life, they ruin your life, they are out there making you crazy every day because you see how bad they are. And the, this happened recently at T3, and uh, one, one of the clues that I knew we were in a bad, bad place is I walked into a meeting. This individual was running the meeting, and I mean running the meeting. No one else was talking. No one else was engaged. My cardinal sin, I hate this. So I pulled him out after the meeting. I said, that was the worst meeting I've been in in years. And so that was my clue that we were into some bad stuff. And so we had to take him out, and he squealed like a pig the whole time going out the door. Uh, it was horrible, but guess what? The next day, it was like the sun rose. And I walked through the cafe, and bluebirds were flying around, and, and, and dogs were smiling. I mean, it was, it was just amazing, you know? And it, so get these people out of your life. I don't know where they are, and sometimes if they're a family member, just be nice to them, but you don't, don't spend much time because they ruin your life, right? Get away. Just get away from these assholes. So... <laughs> And we all know who they are. And I, well, I, have to say, um, I have to say, though, sometimes a person who's an asshole to you may be a saint to somebody else. So give them a chance. Just release them. You know, let them go be good someplace else. It, it usually works that way. So my real success in life has been around, you know, creating these teams, putting together amazing, amazing people. And I cannot thank the people at T3 enough and we've got some lovely ladies here on the front row. Raise your hands. I love you guys. Ladies, I mean. Uh, they're actually helping me in a big way with my book launch. And we all believe in this in T3 because we think my stories are okay about that. Um, so <laughs> I believe them, I guess. So, but anyway, we've, we've really put together kind of a, a place where people can thrive. And that is really, like I said, as a creative person, the happiest, most rewarding thing I can do. And so... Think about for, for each of you, um, when you go back to work today, uh, or if you're freelancing or whoever, you're always working with somebody, right? I mean, I'm a painter again, I have to admit, and that's the one thing I'm doing now that I don't have a team around me working with. I mean, it's my one-on-one -on -one thing, although I do have one critic, and again, it's Lee Gaddis, of course, and so he will walk by and say, hmm, I saw that sky last night and that blue isn't right there. And I go, you're right, you know? So, so I have one critic, it's him. And then the rest of the critics for my paintings are if people want to buy them or not. And fortunately, people are buying my paintings, which is very gratifying too, to come back 
as an artist to do that. But, you know, I think it's really about, you know, how, how can you go back and create teams or people around you and maybe eliminate some people around you that aren't good for you so that you can do the very best creative work you've ever done in your life. And think about how you own that. It's not necessarily, you know, the company you work for or some of the other projects you're working on. It's you have to own culture. You become the light. You become the one who really is leading the teams in ways that everyone feels included. Everyone has a voice. Because it's when all the people have a voice, you will uncover ideas and thoughts and concepts that you have never dreamed could come true. And I watch it, like I said, every day at T3. So I'm going to say to you, go out and kick ass. I mean it. Go kick ass. Life is too short to not do your very best every day. And I know we all get tired sometimes. I mean, sometimes I'm so tired my butt's hanging around my knees. I mean, I'm, I'm on the go, people. I mean, I'm, I'm not the spring chicken anymore. So, but you know what? It's exciting. What, but what keeps me motivated, though, again, is this work that I see coming out of collaboration, inclusiveness, and people who really genuinely care about each other. So thank you so much. You're great.